Good morning. This is Ann Barker. I'm actually uh, in Tempe, Arizona today. So good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. My, uh, my former roles actually were uh, as Deputy Director of the National Cancer Institute. And there uh, I was able to do a number of things that I'm gonna be uh, reviewing today. I am currently at Arizona State University where I am the co-director of Complex Adaptive Systems here and I'm also directive, director of Transformative Healthcare Networks. And um, I'm gonna be talking to you today about molecularly based medicine, what we call personalized medicine or precision medicine. It's got a lot of names, but essentially it's molecularly based medicine. And uh, I'm gonna ask the question is, is this our best hope to finally defeat cancer? And uh, I'll give you the take home message. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic, uh, but there are some issues and we're gonna go through those in, in some detail today. Uh, I encourage you to ask questions as we go through uh, the talk today. And uh, we'll try to answer all of your questions and clarify as we go through if that would be helpful. So, so welcome to everybody and uh, those folks who were just on with Chuck Peru. Uh, I hope you learned an enormous amount about what the great things that Chuck has done uh, for the Cancer Genome Atlas in terms of breast cancer. So um, today we're gonna, we're gonna walk through several uh, areas that I think are gonna be very important in determining whether or not this is our best hope uh, for finally defeating cancer. One is to talk about some of the realities that we're facing in this field. And uh, it's, a, it's a very old field, actually uh, goes back uh, way beyond 1971 when we actually, when Richard Nixon, Nixon actually approved the National Cancer Institute. The work started well before then and continues obviously to this day with a very, very big enterprise behind it, uh, including the National Cancer Institute and certainly the private sector and, and increasingly foundations and others working in the research arena. Uh, the state of the science is, uh, is evolving quite rapidly and driven in large measure by advanced technologies, uh, most especially whole genome sequencing and next gen sequencing, which we'll talk a bit, a bit more about. And we wanna talk about sort of how did, we, how did we evolve this strategy of molecularly based medicine and why do we think it's really important and why do we think that uh, we should uh, continue down this road. And if we continue down this road, uh, where should we be looking and what should we be looking for? So, and then finally, uh, let's look at the near term and the, and the future in terms of things that we have to do to really realize this potential. So, um, so to get started, uh, let's face some realities here. Um, Cancer is an extraordinarily daunting disease, uh, not just the nature of this disease, the heterogeneity of the disease, uh, the complexity, et cetera, but just the sheer numbers. If you look at cancer in the United States, uh, we have about 1.6 million uh, new cases that we're going to diagnose this year. And I should tell you that's substantially increasing. Um, men have about a one in two lifetime chance of getting cancer and women one in three. Uh, 580,000 plus people will die this year from this disease. It's, uh, it's an enormous number. And again, that's increasing. Uh, about, that's, it's gonna be about 25% of our living population today. And uh, that's, that's an enormous number when you start thinking of the size of our country. Um, an interesting statistic that is a grim reality for this country because of the baby boomer generation is that 77% of cancer is diagnosed in individuals over the age of uh, 55. And if you think about the fact that about 10,000 people are turning 65 each day in the US, you can start to imagine that cancer is going to increase and it's projected to increase somewhere in the neighborhood of 30% in the next 15 to 20 years. And that's, the, that's all very bad news, but the good news is that there are about 13.7 million survivors today uh, many more survivors, and much of that is due to some of the targeted treatment that we'll be talking about. The cost of cancer uh, is, is well over $200 billion a year, and that, that's going to increase enormously. This is one of the largest problems we have in healthcare today. And finally, um, mortality rates overall have not shifted all that much, starting to shift a little bit in the last five or six years, but not so much since the 1950s due to the increased numbers of people getting cancer. And um, as we'll talk about later, uh, that's an area where we have to focus. 
the reality is just not a U.S. reality. Uh, this is a world problem. And when I was at the NCI, we spent a lot of time talking to other countries about their cancer problem. And as you can see, in 2008, there were about 7.6 million cancer deaths. Projected by 2020, there will be about 10.3 million, and it's going up significantly from there. And uh, if you look at 16 million new cases um, in that same year, uh, that's going to be an enormous burden for the world, not just for the U.S. or for Europe or for China. But if you think about China, China has 350 million smokers. And as you know, uh, at least in our country and around the world, about a third of cancer is caused by smoking. So this is a huge issue in China and will be and become more of an issue as time goes on. So one of the other realities we face is, is metastatic disease. Um, as you can see, uh, these numbers are a little better than when I made this slide uh, about a little over a year ago. But if you, have, if you have metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis, your chances uh, of recovering and surviving your disease might become much, much less. And regional disease uh, is, is still much more curable than distant metastasis. And for some of these tumors, like pancreatic cancer, uh, we really still don't do very well in terms of really saving cancer patients. And these are areas that are enormous focus for, for, for institutes like the National Cancer Institute and for many of the survivors groups. So. Um, that's all, that's all about the daunting statistics that we're going to consider for the moment, and that's, heaven knows that's enough, but the reality of what this has actually led to over the many years that we've been trying to actually cure this disease and treat this disease more effectively is that we have a pipeline or a drug development process that hasn't done very well. So if you look at this slide, you'll see that from the time we start in the discovery, you say, of small molecules to improving, uh, approving actually a drug, FDA approving a drug. Uh, it costs us about a billion dollars and it takes about 15 to 20 years. Now, that is in large measure due to the complexity of this disease and the lack of effective biomarkers. There are other reasons, but the heterogeneity of the disease and complexity uh, for cancer is, has been a daunting problem and remains a daunting problem, even as we move toward molecular medicine. Um, if, you, um, if, you think, uh, if you think that it would be appropriate, uh, and you have questions as we go through this talk, please ask them as we go along. So um, we don't have all of our questions at the end. So let's talk a little bit now about the state of cancer research. And, um, if you look at where we all started down this road, it started when all the way back in 1990 when there was, uh, there was the uh, national attempt to sequence the human genome, which turned into a major, major project, a very successful project, one of the most, uh, one, uh, probably one of the most transformative projects of our time. If you look at what that project actually uh, really enabled, it was the ability for us to identify these changes in genes and changes in chromosomes actually at every level of the genome, whether it was copy number changes, uh, big changes in the genome or in the chromosomes, RNA expression, microRNAs, which are much more recent but extraordinarily important, point mutations, uh, the proteome, the epigenome, et cetera. So if you go if you go to if you go to the literature today, you will find all of these areas being explored. And if you think about how far we've come in terms of the, knowing the numbers of genes, knowing the number of base pairs in DNA, and knowing that we are still pretty dismal in terms of knowing function, only about 50% of what we know about the genome in terms of mutations or changes in the genome have actually uh, enabled us to understand function. So this is our challenge. Um, understanding uh, changes in the genome is step one. Understanding the functional changes that occur as a consequence is, uh, is step uh, two through whatever. Uh, and we're, we've got a lot of work to do there, and that, in fact, is probably our biggest issue in terms of realizing the promise of, of molecular-based medicine. The other thing I want to point out that at this stage, and it is an area of research for the cancer community, has been for many, many years, 
and that is that cancer occurs in context. So the microenvironment, uh, the architectural issues related to how DNA gets expressed or how it gets interpreted by a cell or within a cell is incredibly important. The last thing I'll point out uh, is that, you know, this is, a, this is a trip that we haven't been on all that long. Uh, the first oncogene was actually discovered in, in only in 1986. So uh, this progress has been pretty rapid. And if you think about where we are now versus where we can go, uh, I think uh, we can expect exponential progress at this stage. So I want to I want to pause here for a second and think about uh, what it is that really started us on this road and and really catalyzed more thinking about uh, what how can we actually understand the genome and is understanding the genome our best ticket to really uh, eliminating suffering and death due to cancer, hopefully curing a, a lot more cancer. So this is a drug that was developed in and approved in 2002, uh, Gleevec, uh, imatinib for chronic myelogenous leukemia. And this is a very interesting story and one that is worth knowing a lot about because it has uh, matured and uh, today we know a great deal more about this drug and a great deal more about this particular change in the genome, which has allowed us to understand a lot more about other diseases. So if you look at this particular change in the genome, it's a fusion genome. It's, a, it's an exchange actually between two chromosomes, chromosome nine and, and chromosome 22, to create a new construct actually. And that new construct leads to a new protein. That new protein, um, as Brian Drucker and his colleagues found out when they started working on this particular uh, alteration in the genome, drives a great deal of what happens in chronic myelondus leukemia. And so that drug, was approved in 2002, and uh, lo and behold, many of those patients, uh, many of whom actually were, were near death, uh, were, were virtually cured. Now, that was the good news. The bad news is um, cancer is extraordinarily uh, intelligent. I put that in quotation marks, disease. Uh, so there are all kinds of backup mechanisms that cancer has evolved. And so we do have resistance uh, in, a, in a percentage of these patients and we now have second and third generation of drugs to treat these patients. But this was a really instructive point and, and I think one that uh, influenced a lot of what came after in terms of expecting that we would find a lot more of these kinds of changes in the genome. Uh, that hasn't proven to be the case, uh, but we have found one more recently, the BRAP gene, which actually uh, is, is turning out to be a very important uh, change in the genome as well. And we'll come back to that one in a minute. Um, but this has been, uh, was instructive in, for a couple of other reasons. Um, this particular drug was very effective in CML, but as it turns out, it's also effective against uh, another change in the genome called CKIT. So this particular drug, uh, this is an FDG PET response uh, to GIST or gastrointestinal tumors. Uh, this drug actually is very effective against these tumors and actually imatinib is effective against several kinds of tumors now. Uh, and that's a story that's gonna be very interesting if you start thinking about this. Here's one change in the genome that imatinib is working against and another one that it's also working against. It's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting sort of uh, dynamic that's, that we're beginning to understand that these genomes, uh, the changes, some of these changes are gonna be common across several cancers. Some are gonna be very unique. So you've got to look at, you've got to look at the drug very carefully and, and, and test it uh, in clinical trials against several diseases. So um, we, in 2003, uh, Francis Collins and I uh, had a conversation. We had many conversations with our board at the National Cancer Institute. Is it time, given, given what had gone on in discovery, what we knew about the human genome from the Human Genome Project, is it time to sit down and, and talk about doing a big science project uh, for the cancer genome? And the answer was yes. We decided to do that in 2003. So we set up the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, some people like it, some people don't like it. It's big science. Uh, I personally believe that we are at a stage in science where we need to balance big science and R01 or individual in, uh, investigator initiated science. 
the goal here was to identify all the genomic changes in up to what became 20 different cancers. And I think you heard from Chuck Peru on, on the last talk about some of the things that TCGA has accomplished in, in breast cancer. So this was a very big project. Everything in this project was highly controlled from the samples and the quality of the samples to um, pretty much everything about the data, how the data was actually uh, deposited, how uh, the data elements were selected, um, how we managed the data in terms of the data repository. And we also had analytical teams to work on the data and we had technology development that both NHGRI and NCI uh, funded during that period. So um, uh, very big science, a very big project, and uh, many publications now in Nature uh, cataloging the various mutations that we have found in TCGA. Some very interesting, some confirming what we already knew, which is an extremely important step when you think about the fact that thousands of people have worked on these genomes. and. We need, we need confirmatory uh, kinds of projects like this to ensure ourselves that, this is, that these data are real. So we used multiple technologies here. We started with, uh, with Sanger sequencing. Uh, we worked our way through and actually adopted next-gen sequencing. And uh, we, we looked at uh, various states of the genome, RNA, obviously changes in the DNA, uh, the epigenome, um, we did not uh, consider we did not work on the proteome in this project. Uh, specifically, some of our colleagues did in some of the centers, uh, and there were a, a number of centers obviously working together on this project and literally hundreds of investigators. So um, if you think about the kinds of things that come out of projects like this, and there are other projects like TCGA now out there, um, this, was, um, this was actually um, the first tumor we reported on, which was GBM, or glioblastoma multiforme, which is an extraordinarily lethal tumor, as you know. Uh, at the time we started this uh, investigation with TCGA, there wasn't much in the literature that actually would inform us about this tumor in terms of how to treat it, how to diagnose it. Um, so what we were able to do <clears throat> is, uh, as, we, as, we worked, as we worked our way through this, um, we were able to map these, map these changes in the genome pretty systematically. And uh, this is expression, RNA expression. And uh, we were able to actually subclassify these tumors. And uh, this has been done since with ovarian cancer and, and other cancers. But essentially, it also allowed us to take the pathways. And uh, as you can see here, the RTK, RAS, PI3 kinase pathway, the P53 pathway, the RB pathway, these were pathways that we knew a lot about, but we were able to map the genomes and the changes in the genomes to these pathways, which substantially improved and increased our confidence that, for example, the tyrosine kinases, we know they're important in cancer, we know they're important targets, but this was a great way to start to look at this. And uh, there were new genes found here, and this is, uh, this is probably one of the best databases out there uh, for GBM. Many, many investigators now working on this tumor, and uh, lots of new drugs coming along and being tested for GBM. Unfortunately, um, not moving nearly as quickly as we would like, uh, but I think in the next four to five years, you will see some significant changes in the way GBM is diagnosed and treated. Um, so if you look at what TCGA did and several other of the large genome projects, in, including an international project that actually uh, used a lot of the learning curves that we had developed in TCGA, the International Cancer Genome Project, um, being run by, to by Tom Hudson out of Canada. But uh, if you look at what this has created, uh, we've kind of created a sequencing tsunami now. <laughs> I mean, we have, we have a lot of sequencing going on. And we're sequencing uh, not just cancer, but certainly across many and, and almost all diseases now. Uh, but if you start to if you start to look at uh, if you start to look at this, it's really based not just on the reduced reduced uh, cost of, of sequencing genomes, but also on the amount of information that's coming from the genomes. And uh, NHGR is is, uh, is recommending uh, that you know that we are to start to really begin to uh, systematically look at this data and, and, and are creating new approaches to that for analysis and, and other approaches. But it's projected that by the end of 2014, there will be a million uh, genomes and uh, the total, total global out, 
output's going to be about 28 petabytes of data by 2014. That's an enormous amount of, of sequence and an enormous amount of information. Uh, we don't know how to manage that, and it's a huge challenge for us in cancer. Probably the biggest challenge we have right now. And if you look at who's producing all this data, it's pretty much coming from everywhere, from the international projects, from TCGA, from uh, pretty much everywhere. And uh, the NCI designated uh, cancer centers are engaged, the pharma bio companies certainly engaged. And so uh, we do, uh, from the sequencing tsunami, we now have a big data tsunami, and you hear a lot about big data these days. Very important, and, uh, and particularly important in terms of cancer. So increasingly, it is about big data. Um, increasingly, uh, many of you out there that are working in the genome space know how challenging this is in terms of analysis. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge problem, uh, and one that, um, as I say, NCI is working on, NIH is working on, certainly lots of private initiatives in this area, especially uh, also in Europe. Uh, and there, there's a book out that you haven't picked it up yet, you might want to look at it. Um, this is now becoming known as sort of the fourth paradigm science, but essentially uh, this is uh, what biomedicine is going to become, or is quickly becoming uh, information and big data is in fact going to be the future of biomedicine. So uh, those of you out there that trained in uh, differential equations and haven't forgotten your, um, your computational skills, uh, you're going to be well served in the future because this is, uh, this is going to become increasingly important. Uh, we don't have enough people trained in this space. I wish we had a great deal more. Uh, I know many of our colleges and universities are trying to catch up in this area now. So if you look at the data explosion in, in cancer and in biomedicine overall, it takes three different forms in terms of variety. There's just different forms of the things that we're sequencing and, and finding out about the genome. Uh, the sheer rate or the velocity is, is almost exponential now, and the amount of volume, as I said, uh, is, is absolutely unprecedented. So if you look at all the data types and you put all of this together in terms of the multidimensionality of this data, uh, 28 petabytes uh, that we were talking about before starts to look realistic and uh, pretty daunting in terms of the amount of an analysis we have to do. And as I said, we now only know about 50% of the functional changes that are involved with the data that we know something about. So um, very, very big problem. So the beauty of this uh, era that we're living in right now, and I think we'll all look back on this era as one where we're beginning to open a new window into understanding the complexity of this disease, um, this big data really, if we manage it correctly and we put the right teams together, uh, I think we can start to deconvolute the complexity of this disease in ways that we wouldn't have guessed even five years ago. And uh, I'm going to spend a minute on that uh, at the end of the talk. So the way we're starting to think about cancer and the way I like to think about cancer and the way I'd like you to start thinking about cancer is as follows. This is a complex information-driven system under the influence of evolution. And it evolves in space over time. Now, that's a lot to think about, but I would challenge you to start thinking about the four-dimensional genome, not just the two-dimensional genome, because whatever the cause on, on the side of your screen, uh, it's my left, I don't know if it's your left, it can be inherited, which is not a, not a large percentage of cancer, but it can be caused by so many different things, including smoking, as we mentioned before, and certainly diet. But wherever you start in terms of the changes in the genome, everything after that is actually under the influence of evolution all the way up to the malignant state. But this is a system composed of many subsystems. So we need to start thinking about this to understand function. We're gonna to have to understand a lot more about the four-dimensional genome. So if you look at the way we saw, saw patients and you see patients as you sequence them, even though if you look at this, going back to the, sub, the subtyping of GBM, every, every line on there actually is an individual patient, no two patients are gonna be exactly the same. But there are common features in these pathways that unite them almost like snowflakes. I put snowflakes on one side of the screen here because as you know, in physics, 
there are, there are some really interesting structural features and physics of snowflakes that make them look very much the same on a gross basis, but very, very different when you get down to the, to the nanospace. And so the same thing may very well, we may need to start to thinking of uh, patients and of the science that we're dealing with in this same way. So the, the pathways that we're talking about are quite common. Uh, the extent to which patients uh, changes occurs in those pathways is quite different. So um, finally, uh, I, wanna, I wanna turn to the question that we ask uh, when we started this conversation, and that is, is molecularly based medicine our best chance to defeat cancer? And I, I'm gonna give you a maybe right now because I wanna, I wanna bring up a few issues, and they're issues that we all have to deal with. Uh, to realize the potential of whatever we have here. And I think we do have an extraordinarily good opportunity to do a lot more about this disease. So there are several barriers. Um, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna talk about two of those barriers this morning, but uh, one that's close to my heart is this issue of high quality data, best practices and standards for the areas that are driving biomarker development. And, and biomarkers are actually signals of either normalcy in a, in a cellular or, or um, uh, a process that actually signals that something is, is okay or something is not okay in the case of disease. Um, the, and, but there are, other, there are other barriers here, like as I said before, translating data into knowledge is probably one of our biggest barriers. Uh, clinical trials and realigning and redesigning clinical trials to accommodate a personalized medicine approach. Economic realities of this, who's gonna pay for it? engaging patients, this has to be patient-centric, and then some of the ethical issues that surround this uh, whole issue of molecular medicine are all things that have to be dealt with. But I wanna talk a little bit about this issue of standards and, and, and quality in this space. And then also, how do we talk and think about this four-dimensional genome so we can do a lot more than we're currently doing? Um, so if I, if I take you back to the Kenter Genome Atlas for a second, uh, we learned a lot in that particular project about the value of standards and the value of actually having high quality tissues, of actually sourcing those tissues uh, in ways that where they're, they're collected under standard operating procedures. Uh, it turns out to be pretty important. And even though technology is moving very quickly now, the significance of Reproducibility of data and reproducibility of findings is incredibly important, especially again around biochemical biomarkers. And I would argue that quality tissues and, and access to quality tissues is going to be critical and is going to be more and more difficult in the future because we're getting better and better actually at preserving, uh, preserving uh, tissues and also in uh, preserving um, uh, life. So we're, we're, uh, by the time we get around to taking out many of these tumors, uh, we've actually shrunk them, and so we're we're actually preserving life, but we're also uh, we're also de decreasing the amount of tissue that we're going to have available. So, uh, but one thing we learned here, and and it was a learning curve that cost us uh, time, and it also cost us resources, was that at that time, and I'm not sure how much has changed. Only about a third of our tissues in the country were good enough to use in the early going of the cancer genome atlas, and. Um, so quality is important, and I think it's now become very important to most of you out there. And um, the second area that is, I think, reflects some of these problems, and not just in tissues, but also lack of standards in, um, in the technology space, is that we are not very good at developing biomarkers. And well, we're not very good at all at developing biomarkers. We've discovered about 150,000 uh, in the literature about, um, a thousand of those have actually made it through the FDA, only about 1.3 per year since the early 90s. And the reasons are complex, but a lot of them have to do with reproducibility of data and the quality of the, uh, of the analytes that we're working on. So uh, this has to be fixed. Otherwise, we can make all the discoveries we want, but we have to have decent biomarkers to, to pair up with the kind of drugs that we want to get approved. So if you look at what we're going to do about the biomarker problem and the standards problem overall, uh, for biomarkers, we don't currently have a, a prospective way to think our, through, think our way through a pipeline to actually develop an end-to-end -end approach to biomarker development. It just doesn't exist. It's been done piecemeal over many years. And 
Janet Woodcock, who's the director of the Center for Drugs at the FDA, has said it's not FDA's job to develop the standards for biomarkers. It's, it's the job of the affected communities. So I'll just mention one of the things that we have done here at Arizona State University in uh, actually in collaboration with many partners, uh, the Critical Path Institute, the International Genome Consortium, Mayo Clinic, um, TGen, and many national groups as well now, is to take this problem on. So we've developed something called the National Biomarker Development Alliance. We'll be launching that in January of 2014. And our mission actually, as this pipeline indicates, is to create a standard set of standards and best practices so that we can actually come up with a prospective, predictable end-to-end -end pipeline for the express purpose of bringing rigor and predictability to biomarker development. We think that will really, really help our communities to get their drugs approved, to get their biomarkers approved, and accelerate the pace by which we can get these targeted drugs into patients. So it's a big tent. Uh, if any of you are interested in joining me in this and joining our colleagues in this, uh, just email me and we'd love to have you join us. So um, coming back to this issue of complexity, uh, I want to spend uh, my final few minutes here on talking about how this cancer community can embrace complexity and think about uh, think more deeply about the four-dimensional genome. This is where progress will be made, in my opinion. So coming back to cancer as a complex system and all the, excuse me, all the, um, all the discussion that we've had about this, sorry. You still, you can still get, uh, you can still make mistakes when you have everything under your control there. Uh, but coming back to this idea that cancer is a complex system, it's not just a complex system in the sense that you're looking at it in a linear fashion. You have to look at it in terms of the subsystems and the interaction that goes on in, in three-dimensional space and over time. And, and time is a big component in cancer when you think about it because it takes, and with many of these cancers, it takes decades to develop these diseases. So we need to understand a lot more about how these changes in the genome get expressed in terms of this four-dimensional idea. And if we can do that, then we'll start to take what we now look at as pathways, and this is a, a Hannah Ann Weinberg slide that lots of people show, but essentially cancer is, a, is an emergent system. It's, a, it's actually the consequence of the interaction of so many of these pathways over time and in space. So just looking at these pathways as we diagram them today, it's convenient, but it's not that simple. And so we have to start thinking about these pathways as they interact and how this disease emerges. And so uh, very, very important for all of us to start changing our mindset about the linearity of pathways. That's not the way it works in nature and it's not the way it certainly it works in, in the human body. So if you start to think about this, and let me just click quickly through this and click back, uh, sorry. This is the problem with animation. Um, so if you start to think about how information drives systems within systems, then if you look at cancer as a system, there are all kinds of length scales. Starting with cancer, it starts down at the genome or even at, at below the genome actually at the, at the molecular level uh, or even at the atomic level. We don't do much in cancer at that level yet, but I predict someday we will. But essentially, you've got to start thinking across scales, all the way from DNA up to the organism. And um, if you look at the variables, then you, you, you're going to move from the changes in DNA all the way up to the organism. And these systems obey the laws of physics. Uh, it doesn't necessarily explain their behavior uh, because it's a divergent system. So the subsystems can, can actually behave in some way, but the emergent system may behave differently. And we see that in cancer and heterogeneity actually produces a lot of things that we can't control. So these behaviors that we see in cancer, whether it's the emergence of, emergence of metastasis or resistance or the ability to actually uh, physically, uh, these cells to move from one place to the other, uh, you, can't, you can't really explain this by understanding the components. So each of these components is part of a complex system and I would argue that's the future. How do we understand complex systems? Cancer is information. It's decoded in context, and so shape matters, context matters, infrastructure matters. This is all information, and the information is being translated 
between the context of architecture and DNA. And uh, people who worry about the microenvironment are starting to really make contributions, I think, in this field. So I think the future belongs to teams of people who are going to work together from theorists in terms of evolutionary theory, information theory, IT and computational and bioinformaticians, and physics and engineering, helping us to understand some of the physics uh, of these systems, and then uh, biologists who actually are uh, developmental biologists, cancer biologists, et cetera. And I think this increasing complexity across all of the areas that we think about from the DNA up to the organism is going to be the future of the way we think and work with this disease and other complex chronic diseases. But cancer is especially going to be relevant to this kind of approach. So I have guarded optimism that molecular-based medicine is our best hope to finally defeat cancer. Uh, I think we're starting to show uh, some real hope in that regard. And um, here's the best hope of all. Uh, if This is just a list of some drugs that have been approved for cancer, starting with Herceptin, which was actually a first of the targeted drugs, um, approved all the way back, I think, in 2000, if I remember correctly. This is, uh, this is actually um, HER2, which is an amplified gene in breast cancer, and that um, was actually uh, worked on and, and pushed forward by Denny Slayman at UCLA, and uh, is used very almost universally in breast cancer today. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of others here. Obviously, uh, EGFR expression in terms of uh, Herbitux is now, uh, is now, we have several approved drugs uh, beyond the list that's on here. Uh, KRAS uh, is a very interesting example of understanding the genome in more detail than we would have thought even important a few years ago. The wild type of this uh, particular gene uh, these cancers respond. If, in fact, they are mutated KRAS genes, they generally do not respond. It's not, it's not an absolute uh, guarantee that if you're wild type that you'll respond, but a very major percentage of those patients do. But what's really important is knowing who's not going to respond. So this is a, another example of, of uh, an approved drugs, a series of drugs now, uh, to treat this disease for patients, especially with wild-type KRAS. Um, more recently, the BRAF gene, um, discovered uh, many years ago now, uh, has been shown to be very important in melanoma, and we have, uh, we have several drugs now approved for metastatic melanoma uh, just in the last five years, along with, and I should say all of these drugs, have approved biomarker tests. Now, there are issues with the tests, and one of the things that, going back to the plans for the National Biomarker Development Alliance, we hope to work out uh, these issues in terms of uh, building better biomarker tests. Even HER2 to this day starts to, uh, continues to be an issue. So uh, we'll, come back to, we'll come back to that at the end, potentially with questions. Um, so I'm getting to the end of my time, and I, I want to make sure that I have some time to discuss with you some of these issues. So in the near future, here's what I think some things uh, here's some things that I think will need to happen to realize this whole uh, future of personalized molecular-based medicine. Number one, we have to engage patients um, in all aspects of this process. This is about personalized, patient-focused medicine. And so we need to do clinical trials and inform clinical trials with patients. And so engaging patients is going to be critical. And I think more and more scientists understand that and are beginning to work with survivors groups in ways that we haven't done before. And that's going to be very productive. Um, we have to know that our molecular signatures or our biomarkers are extremely robust and reproducible. Now, as you know, the literature, there's been some literature recently showing that we have some issues in that regard. Uh, some, uh, actually a fair percentage, uh, of some of the work done in biomarker science, especially, it's not been reproducible. And uh, we need to know that there's no bias in that work, that the data are of high quality, et cetera, because that's the work that's going to get translated by the pharmaceutical companies. Large amount of dollars are going to be invested, and we need to be very careful that we are in the discovery community producing robust data that's translatable and also reproducible. We, need, we really need to start engaging more with computational experts and, and modelers. And we have, this is occurring now. Um, it's, I think it's still pretty modest. And um, 
you know, my, my advice is, is to take a mathematician to lunch and interest them in your science and interest them in your data. Because if we're going to functionalize this data, we have to engage people who really understand how to look at data. And there are people that outside our field who know a lot more about this than we do. For example, people who forecast the weather, they have great models to look at huge, big data sets. Earthquake modelers, I mean, so it may sound a little strange, the, 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 the economists, there are other people who know how to look at big data sets. We need to learn from them, we need to engage with them. Very difficult, uh, but doable. And a lot of those people would love to work with us, especially the Googles and, um, and Microsoft folks of the world. Uh, those are people who we need to engage with. Um, we, knew, we need new and much better clinical trial models than we currently have, especially for our biomarker-driven clinical trials. And we need, uh, we need trials like the iSpy2 trial, one that I was able to work on and, and help to enable it when I was at the National Cancer Institute, still involved with that trial, led by Laura Esserman and Don Berry. Uh, now moving to iSpy3, but this is an adaptive trial that allows us to look at lots of biomarkers and lots of drugs. If you don't know about iSpy2, you can go, go to the literature. There are several, several publications out there now on iSpy1 and iSpy2, um, and also the battle trial of MD Anderson, and other trials. There's a new lung cancer trial coming along as well. So um, another thing we need is these best practices, standards, guidelines for biomarkers which don't exist. Again, that's something that I'm taking on and I'm hoping that some of you will want to join me in that. Uh, we need the evolutionary biologists involved here. Uh, we, don't, we don't have great strengths in terms of evolution in cancer. We know that it's very important, uh, but we, we haven't thought about how you actually model to prospectively understand, for example, resistance. And I think evolution is incredibly important in terms of understanding resistance to the, to the, to the um, drugs that we're administering. And then, last but not least, for this field to be important enough for payers to actually pay for it, which is going to be critical, uh, whether you you know whether you're in the whether you're in the payer community or in the development community or in the discovery community, there has to be a value proposition here. So we we the scientific community is going to have to demonstrate the value of molecularly based medicine so that we can we can actually entice the payers and encourage the payers to pay for this. And uh, that's not a small issue because the value proposition me needs to be demonstrated in very sound ways and in clinical trials. Finally, in the more distant future, um, I think a lot of things are going to change. They're going to really accelerate progress in this space of molecular based medicine. First of all, we need to understand more about the information that's driving complexity, whether it's uh, use of models or actually uh, sort of the definition of state space as physicists see it or mathematically modeling uh, the information that we need. But we need to understand what it is that is most important in terms of deconvoluting the complexity of this disease, especially the pathways and the interacting pathways, so we can identify these sensitive nodes, uh, which are going to be our biosignatures in the future, I think. So coming back to this idea of evolution in context, we, may, we need to actually engage with scientists who understand and measure bits of information flow in systems and how cells make decisions. And cells do make decisions. They actually decide to go down one path or another based on information. And we're getting to a stage now where we can start to ask those kinds of very difficult questions. So again, uh, I think the engagement of some of the uh, physicists, mathematicians is going to be very important. And I know I sound like a broken record on this, but very important that we take biology to this convergent step so we can engage these broader teams. Finally. Um, I think that you know the dynamics and information content that we need to figure out in terms of cellular communication. It, we're just on the just on the edge of that, and so things like chemical gradients. What are what are signals in cancer? And chemical gradients is, is only one way that cells signal, but there are lots and lots of other ways. And those signaling nodes are really what we need to go after in terms of understanding how information is transferred. Finally. Um, these pathways for cancer are extremely robust. Uh, evolution has actually selected for them. So we need to describe that robustness so we can understand how we can overcome it. 
and there, this, these robust pathways are selected for and selected for and selected for every time we give a drug. You need to also begin to de define the information that defines metastatic disease. So we won't, we won't cure metastatic disease until we understand where does the information reside, how is the information transferred, and how can we stop it. And I think that's going to be key. Um, it also, you know, what is the physics of these processes around information? Finally, um, cancer is tissue and organ specific, and we need really to put more of our effort on understanding the structural information in the infrastructure that is, uh, that is the tissues and the cells that actually translate what comes from the genome. Very, very important, big community in our cancer world. And I think they're going to make an enormous amount of progress in the next few years. Maybe we need a cancer genome uh, project for the microenvironment. I wouldn't be surprised. So I'm going to stop there. Um, we have about 15 minutes left for questions. You can send your questions in, and uh, we'll try to answer them. And uh, I'm going to go, some of you have already put some questions up, and I want to I want to take some of those on now, and uh, then we'll uh, we'll come back and uh, close. So um, here's a comment um, that uh, is long, but let me see if I can get it. Um, so uh, it's a question about secondhand smoke. Uh, it says, is the number of cancers attributed to smoking taking into account secondhand smoke and the fact that uh, a third world uh, smoker, sorry, this is a very long question. Um, are smoking uh, poor cigarettes, lower grade of cigarettes? That's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to the quality of the cigarette issue, um, but I do know that uh, the number I gave you does not uh, does not include um, the issue of secondhand smoke. I'm only talking about primary smokers, so uh, that's uh, uh, that's another problem and a very big problem, obviously for the families of these folks. Um, so, um, so this is a second question on biomarkers here. Talking about biomarkers, biomarkers, except protein biomarkers for complicated pathways, how reasonable is it to study pathway gene expression biomarkers? Will NBDA accept these kinds of research efforts? The answer is yes, because I think, I think expression biomarkers are going to be very important in terms of pathway biology. Very difficult to actually interpret, very difficult to really understand and correlate with changes in, in disease. But I think there is, I think we're entering an era where we can, with our computational friends, begin to develop algorithms to capture the amount of information that would be in the expression profile. And there are people working on that. So I think this is a great area. I think it's one that we should not underestimate, but we do need to think about some of the practical considerations of standardizing the approaches and the best practices, the guidelines, which many of you have worked on over the years. We don't need to reinvent a lot of wheels here. So, um, so the answer is yes, very important. As a matter of fact, I think maybe one of the important, most important maybe of some of the biosignature issues. Um, so are we collecting data from thyroid cancer patients as well? I haven't mentioned it. Well, I haven't mentioned a lot of cancers, but thyroid cancer actually is, uh, as you know, a very serious problem. And yes, uh, there are several groups collecting uh, a lot of information on thyroid cancers. Um, I don't believe, I, I don't have the data in front of me. I don't believe that, uh, I think we have tissues for the Cancer Genome Atlas for the thyroid cancer. I don't think that cancer has been, uh, has been run by the groups yet. It was not in the top 20, but there are several groups that, ha that are sequencing thyroid uh, tissues, and I think, we will have good, I think we will have good data on thyroid cancer. It's a really interesting one and, and, uh, and essentially uh, one that we should be looking at more carefully. It is a, it is a big problem in certain countries, uh, more so than in the U.S. Um, so my favorite question. What is the four-dimensional genome? Well, it's my term for what we need to do, and, and it's a bit of a play on words, granted, but if you think about the way we're thinking about the genome today, essentially, if you lay out a sequence, and I don't know how many of you have looked at a genome sequence, but probably a lot of you have by now, 
uh, you know, we're, we're laying out a, a lot of uh, zeros and ones, essentially, is what we're reading from the genome, visual information, in two-dimensional two space. So what I'm asking us to do is to think about moving up in terms of thinking about four-dimensional genomes in the sense that let's think about, let's think about that genome in space, three-dimensional space, and over time, which would be the fourth aspect. So essentially, it's a, it's a way to, to bring together the functionalization of the genome. So I think, it, I, you know, I'm coining this phrase. I don't know if I coined it some, or somebody else coined it, but I like it. And uh, hopefully we can pick up on it and start thinking about how to really delve into the four-dimensional genome, not just the two-dimensional genome. We're right now into the four-dimensional genome producing lots of big data, but I would predict there's going to be a lot of progress and that especially in understanding that, that configuration between sort of spatial issues and how, uh, how information is transferred between the architecture of the cell and, uh, and the digital changes that occur in the genome. And it's a little bit, I think it's hard for us to wrap our mind around the fact that the genome is digital information. It is zeros and ones. It's, it's, it's very much like a computer program. And it's an extraordinarily complex computer program. Uh, we know something about it, but we need to know a lot more. And there's a lot more in the genome actually, actually that we don't know probably than we do know. Um, so how can, if this is how can you get involved and help to achieve your vision of how cancer is defeated? Well, uh, there are so many ways that it would take me a lot more than the uh, eight, nine minutes that I have left here to tell you. But if you're, if you're a scientist, then I hope that you're working in this space of accelerating progress against cancer. Whether it's in the basic science space, which I believe is incredibly important, I think a lot of our advances are going to come from fundamental science in the future. Uh, whether it's in the translational space and you think about how do you actually develop very, very high quality biomarkers or how you develop very, very excellent drugs uh, if, you're in the, if you're in the farm industry. Or if you're in the clinical trial space, how do you do better clinical trials? If you're a patient, there are over 800 survivors groups out there that you can get engaged with. If you're a professional society, uh, then we're, you know, we're, we're focusing on everything, for example, in the American Association for Cancer Research, we're, fo we're focused on policy, we're focused on basic science, translational science, clinical science. So there are so many ways. and. Uh, and finally, make sure that you're talking to Congress about supporting cancer research, because right now, NIH and NCI overall are taking a big hit, and uh, we, need our, we need our fundamental science to be supported. We need our clinical investigators to be supported. So one of the things that everybody can do is write a letter and say, we want to support research. Um, so um, there's a question here that is one that is is very big deal and one that really worries me a lot, uh, and that is this issue of most cancers are diagnosed in late stages, specifically stomach cancer. Uh, when possible, um, stomach cancer is in fact treatable now, but not as treatable as we would like as in in an advanced stage. So. This question uh, that's, that's brought up here is a really critical one, is how do we actually find this tumor earlier? It's a, it's a similar problem that we have with pancreatic cancer or GBM and others. And I think now, with, with, uh, with gastric cancer especially, and it is an accessible cancer, certainly you can, you, can, you can take biopsies, you can do work with stomach cancer that you can't do with some of the other cancers. And, so I am hopeful for stomach cancer, and it's, by the way, it's emerging again in this country. I mean, as you know, it's caused by H. pylori. It's emerging again as a problem in this country. And in younger people, we don't know why particularly, but it is. And I am hopeful that we'll use this very powerful genomics tool that we have to begin to find those very key genomic changes, uh, and we can start looking for this tumor much earlier. And I think it is one that we can start to look at uh, in much, much earlier than we are now. And I'm hopeful on that cancer, as I'm hopeful on everything, but I think gastric cancer is one of those where we can do a great deal more. Um, the next question is, uh, do I see a link between cancer and autoimmune disease? Um, 
Well, I trained as an immunologist, so I tend to see a link between immunity and almost everything. Um, autoimmune disease, uh, as you know, is an uh, extraordinary problem producing a whole range of diseases. Uh, I don't know uh, the answer to your question in terms of is there a direct link, uh, but there are certainly diseases where we have a proliferation of cells uh, and, and some of these pathways, I think, may be overlapping. And, and the whole issue of the immune system and cancer overall is coming together. And this last year has kind of been the year for immunotherapies. I didn't mention as I was going through that last couple of slides, but FDA actually approved uh, since July of 2013 or 12 and uh, up to today, has approved 11 new cancer drugs. That's amazing. Two and two immunotherapies. So immunotherapy and this whole issue of using the immune system is becoming very mainstream and very effective. And the understanding of the intersection of autoimmunity and cancer, I think, is going to be very important. Uh, maybe not for all cancers, but potentially for some cancers. Uh, but at the moment, we don't have that many people working in the space. So uh, if you are working in that space, I, I wish you luck. I think it's a very hard, it's a very hard area, very hard problem, but one that has uh, a lot of promise. Um, so another question, is a public LinkedIn community project a good idea, as we have already started one? Would you help us? I'll help anybody. As you know me, I'm uh, very much the consummate volunteer. Uh, I have a day job, but uh, I'll help anybody. I love the LinkedIn idea. I think it's uh, very important and um, uh, would be, be a way to get, you know, get credentials out there and uh, we'd know uh, people we could turn to for help. So um, the next question is long. Are continuum models that consider unsteady state diffusion and chemical reaction useful to analyze? And are continuum models that consider unsteady state diffusion and chemical reaction useful uh, to, to analyze and interpret some of the large databases that you mentioned? And have there been significant advances in quantifying the kinetics of tumor growth? Let me answer the first questions first. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, this whole issue of um, the continuum that you're talking about in terms of cancer is, is, is not at equilibrium. This is an unsteady state, and it's one that lends itself to the model that you're talking about. So I would say yes, the models you're talking about would be a very high value in the cancer space, especially in terms of some of the big data that you're talking about for some of the cancers that have, um, that, that have great promise to be analyzed in this way. And then, um, have there been significant advances in quantifying the kinetics of tumor growth? Um, I think kinetics in the way that you're talking about it, not as much as we would like. We do understand uh, some better, I think some tumors better than others, uh, but in terms of having a real handle and predictability on tumors uh, in terms of kinetics, not yet, but I think as we involve more physicists, I think we will get there. Um, uh, we're out of time, we got a lot of questions. Uh, which do you think will play a greater part in demonstrating the value proposition of personalized medicine? I think it'll be diagnostics, and I'll stop there. And I'll say that's the biggest, uh, it's the biggest barrier we have, but I think it could be also be the most productive uh, because it has the biggest payoff, uh, assuming we identify the right patients for the right drugs. Um, any comments on, the, on using animal models to study the evolution of the genome? Uh, very powerful, uh, very useful, and I'm hoping we see more of it in the space. Um, and that's a repetitive question. Um, can I comment on the role of computational experts with protein biomarker discovery? Uh, very, very important. Some of the major advances in this space will be made by computational experts working in the proteomic space. It is as close as we're going to get to the state space and understanding the state space, state space of cancer. Um, so uh, drug treatment pushes cancer to progression and drug resistance, which is a major uh, change, uh, mutations. What do we need to obtain approval of the diagnostics and drug together? Uh, you need uh, reproducibility and you need predictability and obviously you need efficacy. And uh, I, I think that that will become more predictive as we get better in the diagnostics space. So um, before I run out of time, I want to just look at the last list of questions and see. Uh, here's an interesting one. 
How do I see emotional factors in terms of cancer's, compl cancer's complexity? I wish we knew the answer to that. We know that stress and other issues are important, but we don't know why. Uh, I wish more of our scientific community would look at that. Uh, it's very difficult to study. Um, do, for predisposition to cancer, is prophylaxis, is prophylaxis promising? Promising, extraordinarily difficult. So um, I'm going to stop there. I didn't get to every question. I'm sorry about that, but uh, you ask a lot of great questions. I am optimistic that, that uh, molecularly based therapy is, is going to take us much further than we are in terms of defeating cancer. Is it the ultimate answer? I think it could be if, in, in fact, we engage the communities that I spoke about to bring everyone to the conversation and understand this four-dimensional genome how the genomics is actually interpreted in people. So thank you very much for joining me today and have a great day.